I am very grateful to all of you for your attendance, and I hope that we could have uh, some interesting exchange on a, an issue that uh, it's of daily concern, uh, the, the, the economic crisis, the financial crisis, and its potential consequences on the um, uh, deterioration or transformation of society. I do want to uh, uh, acknowledge and to uh, uh, be openly thankful to Oxford University Press, my publisher, and particularly to David Masson, my editor, for hosting this lecture and the spirit of continuing collaboration that we have undertaken for the last decade. Um, the hypothesis that I want to uh, present to you and then uh, argue with some information, it's um, that the crisis of global capitalism that exploded in 2008 is a structural, structural in the sense that it derives necessarily from the features that were informing the type of global capitalist expansion of the last two decades. And therefore, although it was magnified by uh, mistakes, uh, management mistakes and personal greed of reckless uh, uh, financial managers, uh, this, uh, this good is not really the cause. Uh, the cause is much deeper and lies exactly in the same, the same factors that explain the fast global expansion of the last two decades. So the same factors that lead to the expansion lead to the crisis. Um, the crisis has been, to some extent, contained uh, this point, uh, to some extent, um, but uh, not to the extent to uh, give jobs back to people. On the contrary, unemployment is on the rise everywhere. Uh, so as, as some cartoon says, uh, uh, two laid off workers saying, looks like the crisis is improving for everybody except for the two of us. Uh, the, but we know that this is um, the, the, the free fall of the economy has been contained through massive government intervention everywhere in the world on a scale never seen in, in capitalism history, never, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the type of, of the scale and the type of intervention. Um, so what I, I uh, suggest, and that I give you the, 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 the conclusion so that you can leave if you're in a hurry, uh, the, uh, the policies and the strategies that are currently in place to handle the crisis may result in a sharply different economic system. Um, very much in the same way that the New Deal in America and the construction of the European welfare state uh, in the 1940s and 50s uh, as a response to the structural problems that led to the Great Depression introduced a new type, a new model of capitalist accumulation, if you wish, that some people have called uh, Keynesian capitalism. Not, not so sure that the, the conceptual precision that anyway we understand is capitalism that was um, more regulated than before with more systematic government intervention and uh, uh, leading to the creation of uh, solvent demand through public spending. Uh, that type of that model of capital which actually was very successful for a while um, was called into question by the crisis of the 1970s. Um, basically because of rampant inflation that was also the consequence of the same policies that ensure growth during uh, two or three decades. So what I contend is that in, in the 1980s, a new model of accumulation and innovation as well was uh, introduced precisely to supersede the crisis of the 1970s. Uh, and that model uh, uh, ensure uh, rapid growth, global expansion of capital was a model basically organized around the notion of unregulated markets, um, major technological innovation linked 
to the technological revolution that was constituted as a new technological paradigm in the 1970s, and globalization. The, the, the three things together constituted a, a new model of capitalism. Again, capitalism, but different, different animal. Not all capitalism are equal. Uh, which uh, was uh, what I called, and I analyzed in my trilogy on the information age, global informational capitalism. Global because it was uh, structured globally. Uh, was capitalist because even more capitalist than ever because it was uh, unfettered markets, deregulation, liberalization, privatization, and, uh, and at the same time informational because it was the moment in which information and communication technology become crucial in uh, uh, spurring productivity and innovation as well as constructing the uh, markets uh, on a global scale. Now, this new system, uh, the global information and capitalism, uh, linked to its social structure, the, what I analyze and, the, and, and conceptualize as the network society, have introduced some features in, in our social structure and in our, in our institutions which are irreversible, such as the, uh, the, the global network society based on uh, digital networking of all core human activities. This is there to stay. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there, there's no transformation of that basic structure. But on the other hand, there were a number of features which are more precisely linked to the economic dynamics, which um, are now being corrected. And then the impact of the crisis uh, from arising from the contradictions of that model of economic growth. Um, and we are now uh, in, on the edge of a new form of capitalism because and the moment in which the system was literally collapsing, a uh, system never entirely collapsed because they are institutions and they are, they are management processes and political processes. So uh, the, an old acquaintance came into the forefront, the state that had been uh, sentenced to the oblivion of history by the uh, free market fundamentalist. Uh, so suddenly, uh, looks like the state was necessary to, to uh, control, to regulate, and to um, reorganize financial markets. Um, the fundamental result of, of, of this and the fundamental aim is to restrict lending, what people say risky lending, to restrict lending. I will give some uh, data on, on the matter. But fundamentally, we are witnessing the end of easy credit. Now. Easy credit was what fueled demand massively. Uh, we live on credit for the last two uh, decades. And consumer demand accounted during that period for three-fourths of economic growth in the United States and two-thirds of economic growth in Europe. So my argument is, is very simple, and then I will develop it. Uh, if we restrict lending, which was the base of consumer demand, consumer demand shrinks, and we have to go into a different model of accumulation and, uh, and uh, expansion of the economy, or maybe shrinkage of the economy. Um, therefore, because of this uh, element in which uh, what was the key factor, easy credit lending consumption, is precisely what is being rectified, controlled, and re-regulated uh, by governments around the world. Therefore, we are moving into a different model of capital accumulation. Which model is what is open-ended, and I will try to uh, argue about it. But um, first of all, I will analyze the crisis, and I will analyze the why the, no the notion that we are living now that the crisis is basically ended and with some fine tuning of financial markets, uh, we uh, can overcome it, uh, is a mirage, is a mirage. And I'm not happy about that because I don't think crises are necessarily great things for humankind. Uh, often they lead to wars, uh, Nazism, and all kinds of other catastrophes. But analytically speaking, uh, we are um, uh, convincing ourselves of something that is not there. Because if this is a, if this is a mirage, uh, then there will be, of course, an, a, a, a 
the economy going on, but will be a new, new economy. We were in the new economy, it will be a new, new economy. And this is actually not, uh, not very different from what the um, financial press is writing these days. Uh, the economists just coined the term, we will not be in a normal economy, but in a new normal economy. Huh, that's interesting. What is a new normal economy? Uh, so it's a, a new normal economy, it's not a normal economy. Normal economy, the one that we use to, uh, to know. Um, now, my argument goes a little bit farther because if there is a new form of economy, again, capitalism, right? Uh, at its core, but not only. A new form of economic activity implies always a new economic culture. Economic processes are based on uh, idea ideational materials, on cultures. The culture of capitalism and the institution of capitalism made capitalism possible, as John North and other economic historians have shown. Uh, so my question is trying to identify, not, not to imagine, but to identify which embryos of new economic cultures can be adapted to the current transformation of the economy. And how much can we or, or can or can't we move away from a current culture, the current economic culture, which was based on unrestricted individualism, economic ultraliberalism, technological optimism, and glorified greed. Uh, so any substantial socioeconomic restructuring implies the formation of a new economic culture. And since culture, meaning, as we know, a specific set of values and beliefs orienting behavior, culture is a material practice. If such a culture is uh, in an embryonic state in society, we should be able to detect uh, such embryos. And that's what I, at the end of the lecture, I would like to try with you in terms of the observation of social practice. Um, so but I will first try to uh, remind you the, the key elements on the uh, uh, process of formation of the economic crisis, then move into the policies and the strategies that are being used, and then try to uh, uh, argue why it's not working and, and will hardly be working, and then finally, uh, which are the roots of the new economic culture. Trying to be very synthetic. The crisis that exploded in the last quarter of 2008 developed in four waves. The first, as we know, originated in the collapse of the financial and real estate markets, particularly in the United States, uh, a collapse that led some of the leading financial institutions into insolvency and threatened the entire financial system, which is the heart, the heart of the global informational capitalism. The global financial system, the global, the, 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 the interdependent global financial market were the, the, the matrix of the entire accumulation process. And it still are, but that's why they have to be rectified and re-regulated. Second wave extended the financial breakdown of the, uh, in, the, in the global financial market to all other economic sectors causing the technical bankruptcy of major manufacturing corporations such as General Motors or Chrysler. Remember, at this point, General Motors is owned 60% by the American government and 20% by the uh, pension funds of the trade unions in General Motors. Um, and General Motors is a very symbolic company in America, remember, since the 1950s. Well, it's basically a nationalized company. Um, this transformation uh, of the major manufacturing corporations in the United States and around the world phased out thousands of companies because the most important thing were not only these, these mega corporations but all the networks of suppliers who were, were always the first, um, um, the, the, the protection against the first shock and that they are the first to go. The third wave induced 
uh, in which we are um, at this point uh, entering induce massive unemployment between 9% and 20% in major developed economies at this point. California is 13% unemployment, to, to mention one of the leading economies in the world. Spain is 20% unemployment, and Spain is the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, the fourth wave, uh, which is simultaneously operating uh, with this uh, mass unemployment, is shrinking demand because jobs are lost, wages are frozen, and companies and households, this is very important, are shifting from borrowing to saving. That's critical. So it's not only that people don't have money, it's that whatever they have, they keep it. And the same thing with banks and the same thing with corporations. And therefore, it's a massive shrinkage of uh, available financing for demand or available income for demand. Why? What, what was at the origin of these four waves? Uh, it resulted from the specific characteristics of the global informational economy, uh, and particularly through a combination of six factors. Excuse me to be so schematic, but it's a complex uh, element with many, with much material that has to be systematized. In fact, this analysis that I'm going to present, unfortunately, uh, leads uh, I don't predict myself, but other people do. And, and, and there was a, a, a book that we published in 2000, uh, edited by Will Hutton and Tony Giddens, um, the title uh, On the Edge, Living with Global Capitalism. So all is there, mm, eight years earlier. Uh, a book with uh, the usual suspects, uh, Paul Volcker, George Soros, uh, Giden, myself, I wrote a paper on the, the dynamics of global informational capitalism, and Volcker and, and Soros explained why it was not sustainable. Um, and they identified, I identified the structure, but they identified specifically the factors that would lead to a potential collapse. I, I refer you to the book. Which are these factors? First of all, uh, empirically speaking, the factor that created the crisis uh, the liberalization and deregulation of financial markets and financial institutions, um, allowing the quasi-free flow of capital across companies and across the world, and this is important, overwhelming the regulatory capacity of national regulators because of the global character of the flows, of the financial flows. Second, the technological transformation of finance. Uh, at two levels. First, the construction of a global computer network of financial transactions that allowed the relentless combination of uh, financial flows throughout the world, creating a, a, a network dynamics that uh, was um, literally impossible to manage uh, from outside the network. And in fact, um, no one could manage. No one could because uh, the new financial technologies and the new computer networks uh, allowed the, 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 the design of advanced mathematical models, models that were deemed capable to manage the complexity of the financial system, operating the financial markets through uh, and being able to predict the potential disadjustments of these uh, electronic tra transactions affected at lightning speed. So the failure of mathematical models the, based on wrong assumptions. The models were great. The assumptions were, uh, were not reliable. That's the key. Uh, you can make stupidity very formal and very elegant. Uh, but the models were based on assumptions that now, that we now have a long, uh, substantial literature on these models now on the assumptions of the models. Uh, and the assumptions were totally unrealistic or based on imagined statistics, statistics that were using proxies of proxies of proxies because you have to quantify something and you use the types of indicators that ultimately uh, don't exist. Third factor, and all this is 
reinforces each other, but they are independent. The, securi the securitization, securitization of every economic organization, activity, or asset, making then financial valuation the standard, the paramount the standard, to assess the values of firms, governments, and even entire economies. No calculation of productivity, no calculation of anything. The only thing, whatever the financial market gives you as value, that your value, period. And new financial technologies made the possibility of creating exotic financial products. Now, by, by now, they are household names, derivatives, futures, options, and securitized insurance credit default swaps. Who would know the importance of CDSs in our life? Now everybody is familiar with CDSs and CDOs and all these strange animals that populate the financial jungle and which are simply synthetic securities. is combining any possible value with any possible value and combining an asset, a synthetic asset, which has no connection to anything but to an assigned financial value and then selling it into the uh, market. And if people buy it, they buy it. Um, now, one key element of, of this was the virtualization of capital in the sense that most capital, they, about 15% uh, to 15 to 1 proportion between assets and what was virtualized in terms of value, and eliminated any semblance of transparency of markets and any accounting procedures. There was not possible to account for anything. Even themselves didn't know. The main reason the Obama administration argued to keep in, in the, the, the jobs for some of the top financial managers of the banks and financial institutions that they go and intervene is that they, they're the only ones who had some clue on, 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 on how to manage this complexity, which is interesting. You create a system which uh, is uncontrolled, and then you are the only ones who know how to disentangle the problems of, of, of the system. Fourth, financial markets were out of control because they do not necessarily follow, in fact, they don't follow uniquely, the logic of supply and demand, and therefore the uh, formulation of the traditional mathematical models. Because they are largely shaped, the global financial markets are largely shaped by what uh, I call information turbulences, uh, which intervene in the calculation of the market. Uh, Paul Volcker wrote in, in this essay, uh, well, in fact, financial markets are largely determined by um, perception rather than reality. Or better say, that I'm quoting literally, perception is reality. And how you model that? I have a student who wrote a book, an anthropology student in Berkeley, who actually wanted to do analysis, anthropological line analysis of financial globalization. He worked for six months in the Chicago um, trade of, of uh, the Board of Trade, and then six months in the London Futures Exchange. She trained herself as a trader. She actually traded. Uh, and her conclusion, which uh, was reported in the New York Times, now, was people were just all have the same information and the same models. So the ultimate decision was just out of intuition in the very last moment. Split second decision. So that's why Schiller has called irrational exuberance. But irrational exuberance, not just of, of consumers and of uh, borrowers, but irrational consume, uh, exuberance of the managers of the global capital flows. Fifth, in the middle of all this, lack of proper supervision in securities trading and financial practices, which enable brokers to pump up the economy and their bonuses uh, through increasingly risky lending practices. To give you one figure, from time to time, I will illustrate, not systematically, just as a way of communicating. 
uh, in 2007 worldwide, the, val the value of the assets of financial companies was about 1.5% of the value of the securities they sold. That's the proportion. You sell, you sell 100, you have 1.5. At an aggregate level, in the US, the debt of financial companies increased from 39% of the GDP in 88 to 111% of GDP in 2008. And sixth factor, the imbalance between capital accumulation in newly industrializing countries and deficit in the United States, Europe, and other areas of the world, made possible that China and sovereign funds, particularly from oil producing countries, kept lending to the United States and to Europe, and therefore feeding the frenzy of expansion on uh, the basis of borrowing. That was critical, particularly at the time with the US uh, economy under the Bush administration reached historical levels of budget deficit uh, to finance the Iraq war, among other things. Uh, this would not have been possible without massive lending from China, uh, to the point that now uh, Chinese, are, Chinese banks and Chinese government are believed to uh, own between 25% and 30% of US Treasury bonds which means that uh, the China and the US are inextricably connected. Um, China doesn't need nuclear power, has US Treasury bonds uh, in order to negotiate with the United States. The paradox for me is that some of you know, I have been working on the book I published in 2001 with Oxford University Press on the Internet Galaxy was largely based on an analysis of the conditions under which productivity uh, and rose extraordinarily during the, the, the new economy years. And that's exactly that increase of productivity and not the internet what was decisive in, in the emergence of the new economy. So this crisis coincides with the new economy, which is defined by the substantial surge of productivity as a result of technological transformation and entrepreneurial innovation. Um, in, but how? Well, focusing just in the United States, where the crisis first started and where the new economy started. Between, 1999, between 1998, 1998 and 2008, so what, that decade, cumulative productivity growth was almost 30%, not bad, uh, for that was the new economy. Um, at the same time, real wages, the same period, increased on, in cumulative terms, real wages, only by 2% over the decade. And in fact, weekly earnings of college-educated workers fell by 6% between 2003 and 2008. So at the same time, real estate prices soar. So the hope was that productivity increases would ultimately catch up with wages uh, because the benefits of growth would trickle down. And therefore, all the lending could be repaid in spite of low wages at the beginning because down the line, uh, workers would reap the benefits of productivity growth and would repay. That was more or less the, 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 the Greenspan type of calculation. It never happened for the simplest and oldest reason in the world, because financial companies and realtors reap the benefits of the new economy. The financial, let me give you some illustration. The financial services industry, share of profits increase in the United States from 10% in the 1980s to 40% in 2007. 10% to 40% of total profits. 
and the value of the shares of the financial industry increased from 6% to 23% of total value of shares, while the, uh, the employment in the financial industry accounts only for 5% of private sector employment. There you have the, the, the major discrepancy between the, the, the weight of the industry and the uh, uh, accumulation on the industry. By the way, the first time I presented some of this data, uh, um, in, that was in May, in the Silicon Valley crowd the, of entrepreneurs, I, I got this astounding innovation because they felt uh, exactly like the creators of wealth that, that they had been robbed by all these financial barons in a, in a truly populist mood, which you would not expect from the ultimate Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. However, in addition to this, uh, this lending frenzy that transformed uh, huge amounts of people in borrowers above their means was not the fact of the banks. That's the other thing. The banks went down with the, with the crisis, but were not the banks that were lending. In the United States, the banks only lent during the 1993 and 2008, bank lending accounted for 20% of total lending. The lenders were all these financial institutions and the new financial instruments, the money market funds, the exchange traded funds, the hedge funds, the investment banks that were transformed in lending agencies in a newly deregulated environment. Again, this is critical. Not only the banks were deregulated, finance was deregulated, and were the new forms of uh, institution, financial institutions, with very little supervision that were, um, that were uh, the, the, the lenders of most of the capital. More, moreover, banks also relied on securitization themselves, and instead of their own deposits, to finance their loans, okay? So banks use their, their, their uh, secu securities, securitization, to finance their loans, not their deposits. And in addition, they lend to each other with the notion that if, if things uh, turn sour, then we can help each other. No, when the crisis came, they were all down together because they were completely intertwined. Now, when the real estate bubble burst, the whole pyramid, it was a, cart, a pyramid of financial cards, went down because, both in America and in Europe, because people were simply unable to repay the uh, mortgages or to pay the mortgages that they had taken based on the value of their homes. So that, that was the weak link of the system. If you borrow on the value of your home, you have to expect another assumption, that the value of your home goes up forever. That was re relatively short experience in, 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 in the economy. In fact, the value of homes collapsed uh, because of uh, excessive prices. People could not continue to, to pay, so therefore, the. The, the real estate market, the bubble burst, like in Japan, like in Japan in, in 1980. But unlike Japan, unlike in the case of Japan, this time where the global financial markets and the global real estate market were intertwined, and therefore the crisis uh, diffused from one another. Look at an illustration of the um, wealth of, of, of this process. The wealth accumulated in the, house, in the household's property in 1982 in the United States were worth of 106% of the GDP, okay? the properties of US households in the United States. Their debts were only half of that sum. Okay? So uh, they have twice more value in their property than what they owed. And then lending was deregulated. That was in 1982. Then lending was deregulated. That, 
Now I'm introducing the same factors that I mentioned before in, in, in the flesh of the economy. And there were two acts, the Monetary Control Act of 1980 and the and Germain Act of 1982, which then these two acts made possible, was not possible before, to borrow on the value of the home without restrictions, depending on what the lender would accept. Right? Now, when the value of the property fell in 2006 and onwards, the reality of the indebtedness became open to everybody. In the 1960s, the savings rate for the US households over their disposable income was about 8%. In the 2000s, went down to 2.7%. Okay? So you go from owning property and being uh, indebted <coughs> in um, a uh, reasonable uh, proportion to um, be indebted to owe uh, way more than you own and way above of your disposable income. Illustration, household debt of disposable income in the United States grew, look at this, from 3% in 1998, this is household debt uh, of disposable income, from 3% in 1998 to 130% in 2008. And therefore, prime mortgages delinquencies as a percentage of loans increase from 2.5% in 98 to 118% in 2008. These are the numbers of the crisis, which again show this incredible discrepancy between the money that people or the property that people actually had in their value and what they were uh, uh, borrowing. And the same thing, by the way, for the corporations. But no one could do anything about that uh, because there were no regulatory instruments and there was no transparency in the accounting and because the models were based on fake indicators. And in fact, the global financial market had become um, controlled by what I called in my uh, early analysis on this theme, a global automaton that is a in, in the truly invisible hand of exchanges, but that was not the market, it was a combination of different factors that no one could control, uh, neither the, 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 the same so-called speculators that were simply betting on the, on the um, value of the exchanges in the market. As a result, when the crisis hit, the value of total market capitalization of the financial markets in the world, the total value of financial markets, fell in 2008 by more than half. Half of the value was wiped out. Uh, and therefore, many financial companies started to collapse. Lehman Brothers was only one that was singled out as, a, as an example by the Bush administration was only the most notorious of them, but many others uh, went down as well. And others were brought to near bankruptcy condition. The IMF evaluates the global loss for financial institutions in the world in about 4.3 trillion of dollars. The current estimates in the US point at the disappearance out of the 8,000 American banks 6,000 will disappear or are disappearing. In other words, the financial crisis that we are in the midst of has a staggering proportions, which has been, to some extent, hidden because of emergency uh, injection of a huge amount of funding, which we don't have. We do not have. It's based on value and it's based on loans that China and other countries have. How governments have um, re reacted to this? Let's say, 
let's re-emphasize that. The proportion of the crisis, the speed of the crisis in 2008 was such that the system was heading directly toward a massive collapse. That's why even someone as uh, non-interventionist uh, in economic terms as the Bush administration or uh, as uh, uh, Angela Merkel or Nicolas Sarkozy in Europe, they were immediately ready to uh, intervene because there was, we were very, very close in a matter of days to uh, a, a, a total collapse. And uh, the Obama administration started to prepare the, the intervention as soon as they had a notion that they would be elected, even before November 4th. Um, so which are these, these new strategies to restore the economic equilibrium? Well, uh, Gordon Brown, in general terms, may have made his last contribution before his early retirement uh, when he said that the Washington con consensus had been replaced by the London consensus. Uh, let's say that the Washington consensus was a, a extreme deregulating philosophy. The London consensus is the promise that we'll do something else. We still don't know what. Uh, the, the notion, in fact, is that uh, to have the state, both as nation state, as network of nation states, what I call the network state, intervening uh, in its leading role as managing the economy and therefore managing the equilibrium of capitalism. And then, if there are any resources left, also patching up uh, the uh, social pain that has been um, uh, produced in societies at large. But first, for the reasons of emergency, we have to restore financial equilibrium. Okay? So this one, two. Then later we take care of people. First, we have to take care of the system. Which mechanism? Well, simply putting them together, you see a logic quickly. Refloating major institutions and major corporations before it was too late. That entailed in some cases, like in, in the biggest cases, like AIG and General Motors, to de facto nationalization. AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, because insures the insurers, and insures the insurers that insure the banks, okay? So that's why they could not let AIG collapse. Could not. Um, bonuses or not bonuses. Uh, well, AIG today is a national company of the United States. It's owned 80% by the US government, 80%. The whole discussion about bonuses for the AIG people or not was because these are public employees now. And they were still uh, rewarding themselves for the brilliant performance as managers uh, and redecorating their offices when they were receiving uh, money from the taxpayers. That was why there was this kind of populist upsurge in the United States. They were literally to lynch the, the, the AIG managers and actually the, uh, some uh, community organization organized tours of, uh, at Hartford, Connecticut, where uh, tours of the mansions where these people live on taxpayers' money. Um, according to the IMF, by mid-2009, governments around the world had invested $432 billion to recapitalize banks and had warranted bank debts for a total of $4.65 trillion. The U.S. government in 2009 owned 34% of Citigroup and had decisive control on the five largest banks uh, in which that received two-thirds of the total government uh, funding. Uh, in England and in, in Britain, you know, British government currently owns 43% of Lloyds Banking Group, 90% of Royal Bank of Scotland, and a long list. The German government uh, nationalized de facto the largest mortgage company in Germany. They own currently 90% of Hypo real estate. 
uh, they own 25% of Commerce Bank and decisive participation in all the key German banks. State-owned banks in China, India, Brazil, Russia, Russia increase their decisive share in the overall investment. In the, um, to some extent, the banks that are intervening in the United States represent 63% of the U.S. market share. But more than that, the federal government and governments in all the countries are warranting the banks. That's even more important. So not only reinjecting capital, but being the guarantors of the, the, the default system. So now banks are not anymore a, a risk investment. Uh, if a thing goes sore, government uh, will, pay up, will pay up if uh, they have the money. This uh, second major line of policy, regulation and stricter national supervision of financial institutions and lending practices. This was, in the case of the United States, in June 2009, Obama increased the role of the Federal Reserve Board, created the federal agency to protect consumers, and uh, issued a number of measures. In the September 2009 meeting, the G20 countries agreed, in principle, a number of regulatory measures, uh, which for the moment have no, not much teeth, but uh, they um, ask financial institutions to reach the level of 5% of the value of all securities they sell. Remember, it was 1.5%. Well, it's not a revolution. They're asking, now you should have 5%. Still not implemented. They don't have the money because, because the money is in financial values that were inflated and now they are deflated. So the value has evaporated, right? Um, also, there were some notions of surveillance measures of on, on offshore financial center, uh, which for the moment, again, are not being following up. One of these days you will see uh, bombing on the Cayman Islands. Uh, since you cannot uh, check the, the, the financial networks, you can bomb the notes. Um, and they even tried to have some advice about limiting bonuses for financial executives, but this is still not agreed and not implemented. So very small uh, level of intervention. Third, all these are mechanisms that are being proposed. Design of a global financial regulation, a global financial regulator that uh, Gordon Brown proposed to be a college of central banks. This is a long way to go because the College of, of Central Banks would require the central banks to agree, which means the governments to agree, which means a global government that no one agrees with. Fourth, in the meantime, in the meantime we create a new so-called global architecture of financial regulation, strengthening of the international economic institutions, IMF, World Bank, and the Bank of International Settlement. That is, to remake the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, but this time, uh, this, time uh, this requires a new power sharing agreement in favor of the countries who have cash in hand, meaning China, India, Russia, and a little bit Brazil. And therefore, the G8, G7, then G8, has now become purely a dinner's club and the real club now is the G20, because they are the people who have the money. Fifth, at the national level, fiscal stimulus to restart the economy in key sectors, particularly in industries that are relevant for infrastructure and employment, such as automobile and energy. And six, in the meantime, to cover some social needs in terms of crisis, extending unemployment insurance, providing housing allowances, uh, in the case of the United States, trying to expand health coverage, subsidizing education, and overhauling of public services. Uh, there are variations in between the different governments uh, for some in terms of the strategy. For some, it's really a, a fundamentally a matter of bringing back the financial health and then letting the market work. Um, 
problem there is that uh, if the uh, same causes lead to the same effects. Uh, for others, what is needed, probably I would say this is the, the mainstream, is a new form of, tempor of temporary kinesianism emphasizing massive job creation in the short term through public spending. Uh, back to Keynes in that sense. I will mention the problem with that. Um, finally, for others, I would probably include uh, Obama here, is that while you do this form of re structuring and uh, uh, Keynesianism stimulating demand, to take advantage of this to push corporations and industries to uh, change their products and their processes. Uh, for instance, the automobile industry, for Obama, yes, uh, we are going to save it, but will not be the same automobile industry, a different kind of automobiles, uh, more environmentally friendly, uh, less uh, consumption of fuel, uh, electrical cars, the whole, the whole package of, of ideas. Completely different, by the way, of what Europe is doing. Obama at least is trying to get, in exchange for his money, because now it's his money, uh, to have a new automobile industry. Europe, which is helping decisively the automobile, the automobile industry, German with Op Germany with Opel, etc., in fact, is redoing the same automobile industry and actually giving money to people to buy the same cars that are being produced. So missing a historical opportunity to have a different kind of automobile industry. This is what I, the, the Obama policy, I call it uh, an enlightened Keynesianism. Uh, so you, you still stimulate demand, but you try to do something literally uh, different and, uh, for instance, creating jobs in green energies and environmental uh, uh, technologies and, and supporting the, the, the expansion of health and education on the basis of public funding and innovation and new technologies. But in all cases, the notion is that in two or three years, we'll be back some, in some way. Uh, the IMF just issued a report a month ago saying not three years, four to six years. Uh, that's the current estimate, current estimate of the IMF for Europe, uh, for Germany, France, Italy, UK, is that if everything goes well, uh, the level of production uh, and, and growth that was reached in 2007 will be reached in 2014 or 15. This, this is the projections, very conservative projections of the IMF. Um, now, the issue there is uh, in order to manage the transition to a new form of economy, the fundamental thing is leadership. And the fundamental thing is trust in the political leadership. And there, we, we know that we have a huge democratic deficit in the world in which the large majority of, of citizens don't trust their political leaders, don't trust their governments, don't trust the, 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 the main uh, persons in charge of the economy. And therefore, uh, the United States situation is somewhat different because Obama still has some level of trust uh, because he's new and he's trying to do different things. But in most of the world, most certainly in Europe, uh, citizens are turning to conservative solutions. They shun any tax increase. They reject corporate bailouts, blade foreigners, and individualize the response to the crisis by breaking networks of solidarity and counting on themselves. This is the main uh, response from the grassroots to the crisis. I am myself, which, by the way, economically means one thing, saving, 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 which means not spending, not spending, not spending, which means deepening the crisis, all right? So this, this individualism and populism means that I don't trust anybody. I'm going to save myself, push out the, the, the competitors for in the job market, meaning foreigners, and vote for parties who warranty that I will get my taxes, and I am not going to to increase my taxes, uh, throws out the foreigners, and um, allows me to uh, uh, stay home with my own savings and warranties these savings in my bank. Limits of these policies. 
of these policies that altogether I call, I call them the capitalist perestroika. Uh, first, because literally perestroika in Russian means restructuring. And second, because that's what Gorbachev was trying to do. Gorbachev was trying to save communism. Uh, good guy, but he was a communist. And he tried to save communists, just failed. Now, my issue is, is capitalism to be smarter? And the perestroika is going to work uh, throughout uh, these years. Here are the problems. The key measures to refloat financial institutions and jumpstart demand depend on massive public spending, of course. And where is the money? According to IMF, taken together, the countries of the G20, and here I'm putting China, their budget deficits have increased from 1.1% of their GDP, their aggregate GDP, in 2007 for the G20, to 8.1% in the second quarter of 2009. Government debt for the G20 countries in 1980 was about 40% of their GDP. It rose to 70% in 2000 and is approaching 120%. That's my point. Yes, public spending, we are going to save everything. Where's the money? Because we already were indebted. We are coming from indebtment. In the case of the US at this point, uh, gross debt over GDP is 112%. Under these conditions, finance spending, finance this public spending, without a substantial inflationary <coughs> surge, without massive inflation, would depend on, technically speaking, increasing economic growth, sure. But you know, first, you need the spending to uh, increase economic growth. So this is delayed uh, effect later on. Second, raising taxes. Great idea in the middle of the crisis with everybody against you. Uh, Zapatero in Spain is doing that. He's going to, to pay by losing the next election. The guy said, yeah, you want me to finance all this and with, with money. I raise taxes. Uh, OK, no, you finance all this and don't raise, raise taxes. And don't borrow, because then you increase inflation. So the guy decided to try his best and die in the trenches. Uh, okay. um, problem is, well, by the way, don't you think it's an, an interesting paradox of history that capitalism is being saved by the last communist state? <laughs> uh, so much for those who like simplifying, you know. Uh, is, is China communist? Yes, it is very communist. Defined by Communist Party control and everything. Is China capitalist? Yes, it is very capitalist. Uh, so China is saving capitalists. That is, the communist is, is, is saving capitalists. But China has all kind of problems. Uh, people talk about Chinese money, but they don't know China. I know a little bit, not much. But I, I, I go often, and I have tons of Chinese students who are super smart. During the first, China is facing dramatic difficulties because of the re reduction of exports to the United States and other countries. Dramatic difficulties. Um, I have the data for that, but you, you have uh, enough of, of, my, my, of this kind of data. But believe me, it's huge reduction. Now, therefore, now China, in order to keep growing, needs to spend more and save less. Right? Domestically, its saving rate in 2008 was 50 percent of GDP. America 2.7. That's the disparity. 50 percent saving rates. And therefore, China also has embarked in a huge government stimulus, uh, about 600 billion dollars stimulus package in November 2008, plus a number of investment by Chinese banks. And in fact, it's this spending that is now government and, and banking lend, lending that is keeping China growing. 75% of China's growth in the first quarter of 2009 comes from lending and spending by the government. So, so they say, well, expand domestic demand in China. Let's Chinese people spend more. They can't. 
That's the mystery that the Westerners don't know. They can't. Why they then can't? Because they don't have any money. And they don't have health, and they don't have education, and they don't have retirement. So they keep saving like crazy the meager uh, income they have. Real household income in the moment of glory of Chinese expansion in China fell from 72% of national income in 92 to 55% in 2007. In other words, the wealth of Chinese people in the moment of the glory of China decreased dramatically. Of course, someone increased, right? Yes, corporate profits increased to up to 22% uh, of GDP in 2007. Now, investment in, in, uh, accounts for 87% of Chinese growth. 87%. In the US, 70% is consumer demand. You see the, the point? In China, is overinvestment leads to underconsumption. So what happens is that people simply save because the money they have is their only security, because they don't have any other security. That's why China is now, uh, this package was built on infrastructure, health, health, and retirement. This package has been to start creating a safety net in, in, in case of social crisis. Fourth genius idea to, finan to, the, spend, to finance the spending uh, without major inflation. Search in productivity growth, that's my formula. Innovation, entrepreneurship, productivity increases, and that has quite relatively uh, short-term effects. Problem with that, productivity growth and innovation depend on two things, research spending and venture capital. That's the experience of Silicon Valley and everywhere. What's happening is um, in the United States, Obama has increased the funding of the National Science Foundation. But corporations are cutting massively uh, R&D. Uh, in Europe, there is a shrinkage of research uh, funding. Moreover, investment by venture capitalism, capitalists in the United States in 2009 was 51% down. So even if people keep inventing, even if people have entre entrepreneurial projects, uh, first the source of science and research is, is diminishes, and at the same time, pe venture capitalists are not there anymore to finance uh, innovation. So remember, these are the four elements on which uh, that show the difficulty of just doing, just financing and spending. So the first magic solution, we, find, we spend, okay? Problem with that magic solution, you need the money. Four ways to try to get the money, you see the difficulties in each one of them. Second magic solution, in order, how can we restart demand under the new financial conditions that restrict Lending, okay? So, remember, lending stops by a large. Uh, how we restart demand? Well, convincing people to spend, it, to spend more, particularly in the European and American. Uh, problem is now, American households have decided to be like the Chinese. Now, precisely now, come on. Uh, they, 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 could, they could save all, the, all their life. Uh, and this, by the way, this is throughout Europe. Uh, but my data are in the United States. Um, in the labor market is uncertain. Uh, financial institutions, they don't trust it. Uh, their, their home values go down. So what you do and under such circumstances, you corner whatever you can and to keep. So data. Uh, in 2007, saving rates in, in the United States Remember, it was 2.7%. 2009 is 5%, dramatic increase 
of savings of the disposable income. I mean, it's, it's slow, but for American standard, it's huge. Uh, and the projection for next year is 10%. So what they are doing is they're paying as much as they can what they owe, and then build protection against the future. And this is throughout Europe the same thing. So lower wages, higher saving rates, reduced credit availability, consumption is dramatically curtailed. And so, another figure. In 2009, the US economy was almost 800 billion short to restart growth at the pre-crisis level of employment. Okay. Um, third problem, there is, at the moment, there is less demand and less investment and less lending. There is a sharp, as a consequence of all this, is a sharp increase in unemployment around the world. At this point, according to IMF, uh, we are losing about 25 million jobs in the OECD countries. And the projections is that it's unlikely that it would be recover most of them. Uh, the forecast of the IMF is high rates of unemployment for uh, the time being, at least for several years, in Spain, Ireland, US, UK, Italy, and Germany, with all double-digit rates of unemployment in all these countries. There are policies of to restore employment, a particular job training program that do not seem to work for a simple reason. There's no new investment. So you can retrain the workers to work where. Uh, so the most popular thing is becoming, and this is one of the things that I want to develop later, the work sharing schemes in place in the in 22 to OECD countries, meaning less working hours with equivalent reduction of the salary. And then for people who cannot survive, government helping the proportion of the salary that is lost. Okay? These are the, 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 the uh, work sharing schemes. So supposedly, you share uh, with another one who will be hired to do your uh, work. This is not going to work. The experience of France, when uh, they established the 35 hours uh, a week, um, was that, well, then because it's a shortage of labor, then more people will be hired. No, companies simply don't hire and put more pressure on or, or better management techniques with the workforce they have. Um, fourth, the duration of the crisis. Uh, is much longer than has been predicted. And the problem is how to keep the, the level of spending that is uh, containing the economy in suspended animation state, how long can we do it? From early 2008 to spring 2009, the crisis wiped out $30 trillion from the value of global shares and $11 trillion from the value of the homes. What, what all these figures means what? Compared to world GDP, wipe out 75% of global GDP. Now, this is the level of the crisis. So the problem is not only the destruction of the wealth, the problem is that the assets held by the banks and households, in fact, are at the same time linked to debts so debts have to be repaid first. So part of the debt has been wiped out by the devaluation, but part of the debt is still there. So banks, when they come back to, to health, uh, just one, one small thing, in May uh, 2009, US regulators declared that most of the banks were in good health. But they are in good health because they are using the money they receive to clean their assets, and therefore they are not lending. They are basically not lending. In addition, remember, even if the banks would restart lending, 80% of lending comes from non-bank financial institutions, which are in complete process of reorganizing their strategies. Because, for instance, CDSs are going to be probably uh, forbidden. Um, 
the, which is, was a big part of the securitization. Um, the hedge funds are going to be so heavily regulated that there will be no interest in being a hedge fund. Uh, offshore financial centers are going to be scrutinized by tax inspectors. Uh, so therefore, the financial uh, industry is keeping tight and concentrating on saving itself before saving the other, like in the airplane with the child. So the financial, uh, the financial companies are first briefing themselves, and if there's any air left, they will lend to us. Uh, that's why people don't have money, keep saving, and therefore all this leads to a stagnant economy in the sense that an economy that um, uh, doesn't consume. So, without going in further technicalities, uh, the notion is that even counting on the successful implementation of some of the policies that I mentioned, the pool of available credit will be necessarily sharply reduced. There will be a shift from market delivered goods and services to public sector delivered goods and services, but at a lower level. And economic activity will stagnate first and then grow slowly for a long time. And public spending, because of the reasons I mentioned, uh, will be uh, suspended in the after a while uh, in its current um, stage. And therefore, from all this real mess, what is emerging is a three-layer economy. First, a much smaller revamp informational capitalist global economy, which will be dynamic based on innovation and productivity and borrowing uh, with um, parsimony and uh, in proportion to what the assets uh, and the projects that the companies have. A new economy is unfolding, is, is unfolding at this point with new products and processes in fields such as energy, nanotechnology, bioinformatics, telecommunication, digital new media, digital entertainment, which is much more important than all the other electronic industries in terms of value. But this is a reduced pool of venture capital and R&D investment, so this has not the potential to lift the, uh, the demand of the majority of the population. So it will be a dynamic sector, is there already, uh, Silicon Valley is doing much better these days, um, but it's a dynamic sector which is unable to generate enough value to stimulate the demand on the economy at large. Second, what is keeping the economy alive is a much enlarged public and semi-public sector connected with a smaller market sector with tighter regulation of financial institutions. And third, there is a third sector emerging, uh, which is linked, is what I call a use value economy, which is linked to the notion that in any major economic crisis, uh, people don't stop living. Uh, they invent ways to adapt. One way is what I mentioned before, I save and I try to do whatever I can with my savings. Uh, I hold into my job as much as I can, even at a lower salary. That's one, what I, what I would call the traditional way of trying to resist the crisis. But there also, there's a new economic culture that may result from the historical convergence between two things, what I call a cultural vanguard. People who have already, years ago, started to live otherwise, to live in a non-commercial way of life, part of their life, not people who have regular jobs, who are real people, not hippies and things like that, uh, real people, but not living completely in a capitalist economy, creating something else. And what happens is that in a, as we look at history, there are so cultural change always happens with people who already have some new ideas connect with the masses who are disoriented and they need something that they can do. 
in this particular case, masses that have nothing to lose except their canceled credit cards. The valued plastic, so uh, revaluing life. What is this use value economy? Here, I could go in, in a long theoretical and political uh, analysis about uh, the, the, the regeneration of capitalism from within <coughs> capitalism. But I'm not a theorist. I'm an empirical researcher. So what I do is I observe what's going on. And what's going on below the radar is thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing completely different things, which is in terms of the use value economy. Like what? Shopping list. Consumer cooperatives. Usually motivated by consuming organic products and environmentally safe products, but, but many other things. Uh, they are based on trust, voluntary work, joint financing, fair pricing, and collective decision making. And there are thousands and thousands of them in Europe and in the United States. Now, most of these people work, have a so-so paid job, but they try in their consumption to move to other criteria and to reorganize their consumption level, uh, concentrating on um, the life that consuming what they really need and like, not in a bigger car, bigger house, etc. Second, producer cooperatives, often connected to consumer cooperatives as their trusted suppliers. The nucleus here is in the realm of agroecological production. Uh, Southern France is full of, of, of consumer producer cooperatives on agroecological production. Some of these cooperatives are for profit production, but operating on different principles of traditional market. For instance, increasing the value of the share of the worker depending on her contribution to the cooperative. Third, a, a major explosion of urban farming, particularly in the United States, starting with Michelle Obama planting tomatoes in the lawn of the White House which, yes, is symbolic. I don't think the White House is going to live out of the tomatoes of their garden. But first, her children are getting the idea. More importantly, thousands of schools in the United States had gotten the idea. And they have joined the movement. And now schoolyards are becoming urban farming projects. Uh, and, and again, all this is not, is not simply to to be a CC fashionable eco ecological activist, um, it tweeted. It. It's actually tweeted, it and and do it better and cheaper. So it's a segment of the consumption, of the household consumption, but it's a segment. Barter networks and time banks, huge expansion of this, uh, and using the internet among other things creating a sort of non-monetary eBay market or Craigslist uh, in which uh, people, uh, in some cases, even the outskirts of Barcelona, one of the studies I'm doing, people have printed their own currency. But in fact, it's calculated in terms of time. How much time uh, are you going to, uh, I'm going to do to help you, and how much you are going to help me. And in order to not to go into calculations, they have a currency in minutes. That is exchanging lifetime for lifetime. Communal living. We all have this image of the 1960s and 70s commune, uh, kind of endless sexual orgies. And, uh, well, in fact, communal living is now, for many, many young people in the world, it means actually live with six others. It's the only way to survive the housing crisis and to put together things and take care of each other and not be so lonely. So again, here is not a marginal phenomenon. It's a mass phenomenon, which is because, oh, yeah, they're young. One day they will buy their big suburban house. They, they would if they could. And, and here is the point. Uh, the more we go, the more these practices become practices of what you can do, while the notion of the ideal consumer, happy consumer with unlimited credit, that is unreal. Transformation of transportation system in the cities. Uh, 
we are transforming the way we live by changing the transportation system, starting from the grassroots. And in some cases, municipal governments uh, help. In some cases, uh, like in Paris, they have this great idea of a shared bicycle line shared with the buses. Okay? Um, one way to exterminate cyclists very soon. Uh, so the, in, in, in the United States, as some of you know, there is a social movement called Critical Mass in which uh, hundreds of cyclists at one particular, actually on Friday at 5 p.m., uh, in cities that resist bicycling, they try to uh, introduce the possibility of uh, blocking the, the traffic to show that they could actually go faster than with a car. Even in Los Angeles, come on, if Los Angeles can go on bike, uh, something has changed. Now, how you go on bike in Los Angeles, by the way? Read my article, actually, the article of a uh, friend and colleague of mine, La Laura Burhalter, a professional architect. We wrote an article together, published in a journal, uh, very good architectural journal online, which is called Archie Nect, Nect with ECT, in which we have all kind of, we call it to our new urban paradigm, in which we build on experiences, and then she goes farther than, than I do and proposes a number of things. And she has designed, for instance, a bicycle freeway system overlaid over the Los Angeles automobile freeway system. Uh, with uh, open space in between and the possibilities to actually uh, stop from time to time and have a shower uh, before going to work. Uh, now, her point is very realistic. Obama is putting money in infrastructure, so actually building more freeways, which is a way to increase traffic jumps, as everybody knows, in the planning world. Uh, so why the same money? It's done in a different way, in an innovative way, by increasing the possibility of a separation, remember Le Corbusier, separation of, of automobile traffic, bicycle traffic, and at the same time, outdoors cafes uh, in, the, in the middle of the, in between the two lanes. And if you have, if you have a bicycle lane, uh, which is uh, unimpeded, you have, on average, 30 kilometers per hour. And by the way, there are all the, the the side effects about the health, about the, the lack of pollution. So that's what I call different ways to articulate life practices, including transportation practices. Community banking, another phenomenon going on. Taking over local financial institutions that have been bankrupt, sometimes with the help of government, and putting in common the necessary funding to save the neighbors from foreclosures in their houses. Volunteer-based social services, medical clinics, psychological counseling, legal support, which always has existed, but is increasing. Why is increasing? Because people don't have the money to pay for all this, and then they go to these voluntary services that people have more time because they have less work, because they are paid less. Counseling networks of public health practice has been very important. Uh, there are Counseling networks are uh, proven to diminish people's consumption of pharmaceutical drugs by being in good health as a result of better living habits. And drug, uh, the, the, the share of the budget paying for medicine is huge uh, in many countries. And has been shown a direct relationship. If you do a number of things, you don't have to pay for all these drugs. Doctors in principle agree with that, but in practice, doctors are at the receiving end. Uh, they ultimately, when people get sick because of their uh, health habits, then they go to the doctor, and then doctors have to pay to, to give them the uh, drugs prescribed from pharmaceutical companies, which are a significant part of total consumption in the country. And then a revival of voluntary associations in all kinds of forms, um, the local celebrations, open concerts, performances, all this is on the rise and is use of time and in economic terms consumption, but non-commercial consumption. And finally, something that now people are reconsidering and reconceptualizing. We know that there's a huge culture out there of P2P uh, digital networks sharing 
uh, entertainment or cultural products and music and um, sharing open source innovation in the computer world, developing cultural music and technology for their own pleasure and then exchanging it. Uh, this is governed not by, by profit orientation, but by what Pekka Himanen has called the hacker ethic, which is, of course, not hackers. Uh, these are the crackers, the bad ones from the press are the crackers. The hackers are the good ones. And the hackers are people like Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, the hackers are those who created the internet and who create all the time innovation, Linus Torvald, et cetera, et cetera, and thousands and thousands of others. So this is a typical example, a typical example of why the, uh, the, the um, uh, innovation as a passion can actually contribute very substantial products. Hey, the internet, after all, thanks to that we make a living these days. Uh, the, the internet, well, the internet was not government and was not commercial, was created by people with a passion to create the internet and with the idea that rather than copyright the internet, imagine if Tim Berners-Lee would have copyrighted the World Wide Web. But so what? They make some more money. But they don't change the world because much fewer people would use it, uh, much less activities and would be found. So the, the, the passion of creativity has driven most of the information economy we have today. It does not come from profit. It does not come from the Bill Gates. It comes from people who do the passion, have the passion to create. Then some of them uh, also go and build huge corporations out of uh, their ingenuity. But if they would have a start with the idea of making money, they would not be able to innovate and they would not be able to create the, the innovative large corporations that we have today. So of course, the entire economy cannot be based only on these practices. And this is why we still need the reconstruction of a form of innovative global capitalism based more on the culture of innovation rather than in the technology of financial and real estate speculation. But I contend that these decommodified economic activities represent already a significant share of activity, in fact, with millions of people involved. And in the context of massive shrinking of monetized consumption capacity, the whole range of economic practices based on a different principle may provide access to goods and services to millions of people using their time, their minds, and their personal networks rather than their scarce money and limited credit while reducing their need to consume, to consume things that in fact hardly need. Now, certainly, uh, this is not my manifesto or my proposal. I'm identifying. Uh, I am a researcher, and my primary goal is to observe in the coming years how new social practices may emerge to deal with the contradictory situation of a consumption-led capitalism that is no longer able to produce, to provide the means of consumption. And it looks to me like in the last resort, the decisive battle against capitalism may not be about the means of production, but about the means of consumption. And therefore, is primarily a confrontation between different economic cultures. Thank you for your attention.